songs that we just sung, uh, especially the idea of focusing on God and that we just want to be like him. And that hopefully that's been what we've learned throughout this series about the Israelites after they returned home from exile, whether they were living like God or not. Hopefully we've been learning from their examples and wanting to be more and more like our God above. But in the last lesson, we saw the Israelites uh, during the time of Nehemiah making some very specific plans and commitments to repent and to serve God faithfully. But making plans and preparing is not enough. Sometimes we tend to spend our time preparing, planning, making all kinds of specific plans. Maybe even we start following through with those plans that we've been making, only to start growing tired of doing those things. To start doing those things, but doing them half-heartedly, perhaps. Maybe by being careless in the way that we're doing them. And maybe even we start becoming prideful or arrogant of the good things that we're doing. Hey, I'm doing these wonderful things and look at me for that. Well, that's where we find the Israelites when we reach the book of Malachi. About 15 years after the events in the book of Nehemiah. Um, anyone who, who knows me very well uh, would know that I'm a huge fan of the Minor Prophets. Um, I just think there's these small little Old Testament prophets are, are bite-sized chunks that we can just read over and over. And they're easy to grasp at what they're talking about and then step back and after we get after them for all their sins, we step back and realize, oh, that's just like me today. We can make an application to ourselves. You can see them maybe being unfaithful by choosing physical idols over God, like in the book of Hosea. But then you realize that we are often also unfaithful to God by choosing things over God. Even if those aren't literal idols, we choose things above God sometimes. You can see them being reprimanded for pausing the construction of the temple in the book of Haggai, which we talked about earlier this week. But then you realize that maybe you've put off your own construction of the temple of God today, that being yourself as a temple of God or being the temple of the church. And you can see them maybe rejoicing uh, or rejecting, rather, God's words and asking just tons of arrogant questions and refusing to see the ways, the things in the way that God sees them, like in the book of Malachi. But then you step back and realize that sometimes you ask just as similar arrogant questions. So today we're going to have a sort of overview of the book of Malachi. Hopefully you can open up to the book of Malachi and follow along this evening. But we'll be specifically considering their arrogant questions that they kept asking God and asking ourselves, do we ask very similar or even the same arrogant questions today? So in the book of Malachi, um, and beginning in chapter 1 and verse 2, God says to his people, I have loved you. And what a just wonderful statement for God to say uh, and for them to be able to hear. God's the creator of the universe, the all-powerful, the one and only God cares about them. And our God has made very similar statements to us in the New Testament. In fact, about all of John's writings just emphasize this love of God for us, his people. What an incredible thought and a comforting thought to know that our God loves us. But sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes it doesn't look that way. Notice their response to what God said in their first arrogant question. They say, how? How have you loved us? In chapter 1 and verse 2. God told them that he loves them, but they don't believe him. They look at what's going on in their lives at that time. As we've talked about throughout this week, they're fresh out of 70-year captivity. They're living in a city mostly of ruins with enemies on every side. They're being threatened constantly, as we've talked about earlier in the week. And things just don't seem to be the way that they were expecting them to be. And so they say, how? How have you loved us, God? Do we feel that same way sometimes today? God has told us that he loves us, but we look at what's going on currently in our lives. Maybe there's some hurt in your life. Maybe there's some grief or trials or temptations. Or maybe you had some expectations for what it would be like to be a Christian and it's just not been met. And we ask God, well, God, how have you loved us? And so God responds to them there in chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. But his answer isn't just to show them all the ways that he has, uh, all the things that he's doing for them, all the ways that he's blessed them, all the ways that he's about to bless them and the blessings to come, and that their life is just going to be grand because he loves them. No, that's not what God tells them. Instead, God's response focuses on Esau and the hopeless state of his descendants. They don't have God in the land of Esau and the Edomites, and, and so how is their life going? Well, he says, even if they build up, it will be torn down. So when you look at your life, 
and you come to the conclusion that God just doesn't love you, and you cry out to him and you ask, well, how have you loved me? I would encourage you to do the same. Consider those who do not have God. And sure, some people who are living their lives wickedly, they may have more earthly riches than you. They may have bigger homes at times or more friends or whatever else. But all of those things that they build up will one day be torn down. All of this life's treasures will come to nothing, will disappear, will be meaningless. At the very least, when they die, they're going to do them no good. In fact, that's what the whole book of Ecclesiastes and the book of James over and over emphasize, that this life's riches are worth nothing if we don't have God. So what do the people without God have? Well, they have no hope. They have no eternal joy, no reason for living, no purpose in life, no lasting riches, and no relationship with God. And while that's a sad reality, in contrast with that, your life now might be difficult. Your life now might be hard to see how God loves you. But because God loves you, you do have hope. We do have eternal joy. You do have a reason, reason for living, a purpose in life, and you're building up treasures that are not going to be destroyed by moth or rust, but they're going to be a lasting treasure. And you do have a relationship with God in heaven. And so the result when we consider that God's love for us is that we should turn around, just like God said the result should have been in Malachi's day in verse 5. He said, your eyes will see this and you will say, the Lord be magnified beyond the border of Israel. The results of this uh, recognition of God's love should have been praise and honor for God's name. But God says in verse 6 of Malachi chapter 1, that while a son honors his father, while a servant honors their master, and even though God is our father and our master, they, and sometimes we today, had failed to give him the respect and honor that he was due as their father and their master. And their response to this when he says, you aren't respecting me, is how have we despised your name there in verse 6? You'll see it throughout the next couple chapters that these priests and the people, they're still doing religious things. They're still presenting food on God's altar. They are still entering the gates of the temple to, to kindle fire on the altar. They're still making vows and offering things. They're still instructing people and teaching people God's laws. They're still crying out to God with tears and with weeping and with groaning. Well, isn't that enough respect and honor for God if we're doing all those things? Aren't those things that God asked for? What more could they do to honor God? You know what? We today, the priests of God today, we're sometimes in a very similar place. We're still doing religious things. Maybe from last night you take that list of ideas of ways to grow, and you're like, I'm going to do those things. But while doing those things, maybe you're entering the doors of the church building twice a week. Maybe you're offering up songs and prayers of praise. Maybe you're gathering around the table of the Lord, or we're teaching and instructing people about the covenant. Or maybe today, if someone is weeping and crying and just groaning in their prayers to God, we would look at them and say, well, certainly, they're just giving God the utmost respect and honor, right? What more could they do to honor God? However, the Israelites in Malachi's day, and sometimes us today, we have blinders on, and they were ignorant or apathetic about their, their heart, about the attitude, about the way that they were doing these things. We see and we make others sh make sure that others see our good deeds, but we're blind to the horrors of the heart within while we do those good things. And so God's, God answers their question. They ask, well, how have we despised your name? And he tells them how they had despised his name. First, they were defiled, they're presenting defiled food on his altar in chapter 1, verses 7 through 14. But of course, they're not going to take that answer uh, without a response. And so they respond with yet another arrogant question, an arrogant ignorance, by asking, well, how? How have we defiled you? And so God answers that question by explaining to them the ways that they, they have defiled and presented defiled offerings to him. They have defiled him by first saying, the table of the Lord is to be despised, there in chapter 1 and verse, uh, verse uh, 7. They said the table of the Lord is to be defiled, and as for its fruit, it is to be despised in verse 12. Their attitude while giving these offerings mattered. Do we come to God and offer to him our worship 
but we just don't really care much about it? Do we value that worship? Um, we aren't, aren't caref- are we careful about doing it right? Or do we pay much attention to what we're doing, and what we're saying, and what we're singing? Or do we feel like, oh, it's to be despised, it's to be taken lightly? And the second way they've been defiling him by their offerings was that they were offering things that were leftovers. They're offering their leftovers to God in verses 8 to 9 and verse 13. They would have never offered those damaged goods to their governor. Well, are we today offering our leftovers to God in ways that we would never do to those that we respect around us? We never offer those things to our governors or our bosses or our friends or those that we love and respect. Maybe that's in our offerings of our time. Well, I would give this person this amount of time, but we'd never give God that amount of time. Or maybe that's in our conversations. We'll talk with this person for hours on end because we respect them, but we won't talk to God. Maybe it's in our attention or our money or our priorities. We would never give those leftovers to the people that we respect, but we'll give the leftovers to God. But they also had defiled God by saying in verse 13, My, how tiresome it is, and by disdainfully sniffing at it. Again, their attitude, but this time they're not just careless, they're bored of worshiping God. Do we come to worship twice a week, maybe, but think and say, well, it's just tiring, it's just boring, or it's a chore? Have we grown tired of our own at-home reading of Scripture, or grown tired of singing hymns and praying to God? Are we growing weary of doing good, as Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 puts it? We're still doing those things, yeah, but we roll our eyes when someone suggests doing any more of that. And we say something like, nah, I'm good with just once or twice a week. I don't need any more. That's enough for me. They had grown tired of worshiping God. But also they defiled him by vowing the best in verse 14, but not giving any, the best, giving much less. Someone had a good animal in their flock, and they would vow to give it to God. But when they came around to actually giving the sacrifice, then they would just give an animal that they didn't really want anyways because it had some issues. Sounds great to promise great things to God, especially if others hear us uh, volunteering to do something. Maybe we say, well, yes, I'd like to be a part of that study if it gets started. Or yes, I want to be part of that evangelistic effort. Or I want to be part of that prayer group. Or I'd love to sing, learn more songs and sing those songs. Or, or maybe I'd be willing to help out if anyone ever needed anything. But as soon as that need arises, as soon as that opportunity is offered, when it comes time to deliver, we don't show up. Or we do show up, but we're only giving half efforts. Or only the time or the possessions that we didn't really want anyways. We're not giving our best. But God also tells them not only have they defiled him um, in this way, but he shows them his reaction to that. His reaction to them having these attitudes of half-hearted and incorrect worship. First, he says that he is not pleased with their offerings in verses 9 to 10, or 8 and 9. He says, even your governors wouldn't have been pleased if you gave these things to him. Sometimes we get the idea today that God's just going to be pleased as long as we're worshiping him. It doesn't matter how we do it or with what heart or whether we do it in the right way. As long as we're worshiping God, then God will be pleased with our half-hearted or even incorrect worship. God says he's not pleased with this worship. He says he, he, is, he reacts by telling them to entreat God's favor in verse 9. We must recognize our guilt. We must repent, confess to him, and plead for forgiveness, for grace. He reacts by, in verse 10, by saying he would rather this worship just stop altogether. Can you imagine God today just saying, would somebody just chain the doors of this church building closed? I would much rather them not come in here and worship because they're not giving their full heart or, or they're not interested in worshiping me and they're just doing it anyways. Or, or they say they don't even care about doing it the way that I've asked and so I just wish somebody would chain those doors closed. We saw that same kind of attitude, that same kind of statement in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and Isaiah chapter 1 on Sunday morning's lesson. God says, I don't want this kind of worship. Just stop. He reacts in verse 10 and verse 13 by saying he will not accept it. In verse 11 and verse 14, he says, his name will receive the respect that is due uh, with pure sacrifices by all nations. Even if they won't respect him and give him the respect due, others will. You know what? We may not give him the respect he's due, but others will. 
One day we will all bow before God. And Philippians chapter 2 describes that. We'll all bow before him, whether we're in terror or in exultant worship before our God. And God reacts by showing them that he will curse the one who gives this kind of half-hearted and incorrect worship in verse 14. But this is not the only way that God, they have been despising God's name. First, they've been despising God by offering this defiled food on his altar, as we talked about in verses 7 through 14. But also in chapter 2, verses 1 to 9, they were despising his name by the priests who were corrupting their covenant with God. And God had made a covenant with Levi. He had a special relationship with them. You see there in verses 5 through 7 that this relationship was a role, a special role of teaching the people. Today, we are the priests who have a very similar role. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12 says that we are the priests, a royal priesthood, and we're to go out and teach the excellencies of God. But they, and maybe sometimes we today, had turned aside from this way in verse 8. In verse 9, it says that the instruction was with showing partiality. In verse 8, it says they had actually caused many to stumble through their teaching. And verse 2 says because they didn't take it to heart to give honor to God's name. They weren't taking this seriously, and so actually their teaching was defiling that covenant and was causing people to stumble. You know what? We need to make sure that we view God in honor, that we stand before him in awe, and that we keep our covenant with him by preserving knowledge and being messengers of God who instruct those who seek without partiality. And God's response to them in verse 2 was to curse them. His response in verse 3 was to rebuke them. In fact, it says to spread refuse in their faces. In fact, the refuse, the dung that they were supposed to take out of these sacrifices and they weren't doing, God says, okay, we'll just rub that in their face. He says in verse 9 that they were going to despise and debase them before all people because that is what they were doing to his name. But that's not the only way that they had despised his name. In chapter 2, in verses 10 through 16, they were despising God's name by dealing treacherously with their families. Specifically, there in verse 2, they're dealing treacherously with their brother, or sorry, in verse 10, dealing treacherously with their brothers. And then verses 11 through 16 with their wives. But they didn't notice that they were dealing treacherously with one another. They had these blinders on that made them ignorant, which leads them to asking this next arrogant question. They say, for what reason? In chapter 2 and verse 14. In chapter 2 verse 14, God describes another thing that they do. But this one initially looks good. They are covering the altar of God with tears, with weeping, with groaning. They're calling out to God for help and for blessings, and they're making quite a show of emotion and offerings, which are all good things, except God says he will not regard or accept these offerings. He won't hear their prayers. And so they respond, for what reason? God, we're doing all this. Why aren't you hearing us? And they're mad at God because they are being so religious, and they're doing the things that he said to do, but God doesn't seem to be answering their prayers. Have you ever felt like that? You are crying out to God with much emotion, with much sacrifice, and yet nothing seems to happen. God doesn't seem to hear it. And so you cry out to God and you say, God, why aren't you hearing my prayers? <clears throat> why aren't you blessing me? Now, the reason that we may feel unanswered may be different from their reason. It may not always be the same reason their prayers went unanswered, but sometimes it could be. And here, it's worth considering our ways, as we talked about in the book of Haggai, chapter 1. Well, what reason did God give for refusal to receive the offerings? Well, he says, because God had seen, he had been witness to their treacheries against their family. They had dealt treacherously against their brother, in verse 10, which had profaned their covenant with God. Do we deal treacherously with our brothers and our sisters in Christ? If so, that is profaning our covenant with God. I mean, we talked about that more earlier in the week in Nehemiah chapter 5 on Tuesday uh, when we discussed that we are stronger when we are together rather than being divided in the time of persecution or even fighting among ourselves. And when we fight with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're, we're fighting against the body of Christ. And that profanes our covenant with God. 
We must instead be united with one another and working in harmony side by side, as we talked about in Nehemiah chapter 3 on Monday. But they had dealt treacherously against God, not just against their brothers, but they had dealt treacherously against God by marrying these daughters of foreign gods, which, as it says in verse 11, have profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves. Do we deal treacherously against God by marrying people who have no interest in God? Or they dealt treacherously with the wife of their youth in verses 14 through 16 by divorcing her, which ignored their marriage covenants. It ignored the hope of godly children. Do we deal treacherously with the wife of our youth by maybe divorcing or by maybe mistreating or maybe harming our children and their hope of being godly? So God says because of the way that they're treating their family, he will not take heed to their offerings. Nor will he take heed to their spirit. God is pretty consistent with this idea throughout scripture. That he will not hear the prayers or receive the offerings of those who are living in sin. And whose hands are covered in blood with violence. Isaiah chapter 1 and Haggai chapter 1 we talked about earlier in the week. But also James chapter 4 and verse 3. And 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7 talked about this idea that if we're mistreating those around us. God says I don't want to hear your prayers if you're going to treat people in that way. By this point, we probably get the picture. The Israelites are asking these arrogant questions. They're constantly hurling these accusations against God. And God is unsurprisingly, as we get to verse 17 of chapter 2, he's unsurprisingly tired of their words. But they still have their arrogant blinders on. And they are ignorant or apathetic of what they're doing to God. And so they ask, well, how have we wearied him in chapter 2 and verse 17? Do we talk against God, question his every statement, question every way he says we should do things, reject any accusation against us of doing any wrong, we refuse to see things in God's ways, and then we refuse to acknowledge the fact that our rejection of his will would have an impact on the God who started out by this whole book by saying that he loved us? Do we re refuse to acknowledge that this is going to weary and hurt him? And so God answers that question with more words that had wearied him, um, which, which by, is by saying that God delights in those who do evil, or by asking the question, where is the God of justice? Both of those are, the, both the statement and the question there are different ways of accusing God of the same thing. What they're saying is that God is not dealing out retribution toward the wicked. They say that the wicked are getting away with their sins. They're saying God is not just. What an absolutely arrogant and ignorant and bold thing for people to say when they themselves are living in all kinds of sin. They're living in sin and yet they're saying, God, why aren't you punishing people living in sin? And yet they don't see the danger of what they're asking God to do. Yet how often do we do the same thing today? We overlook our own faults and our own sins only to get mad at God when he allows others to get away with their sins. We look at someone else and we say, that person's sinning and they're getting away with it. And maybe we're doing the exact same thing or something similar. How often do we just ignore the log that is in our own eye in order to judge someone else for the speck that is in their eye, if we use the language of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. And so God responds to their accusation that saying that the God of justice, justice is on his way. He says, I am on my way. I'm sending my messenger. God will send his messenger to prepare the way before himself. And when he arrives, he says, well, who can endure the day of his coming? God himself will come and he will purge the evil from their midst. We see there at the beginning of chapter 3. That he would leave only the righteous and the pure in the kingdom of God. That he would draw near with swift judgment against all those who were doing the sins which the Israelites had been convicted of throughout this book. They say, well, God, why aren't you doing anything? Why aren't you punishing the righteous, or why aren't you punishing the wicked, rather? And God says, all right, I'm on my way, and you won't be able to stand before me. God himself will come and purge the evil from their midst. But God doesn't change, which means that while he is a God of wrath, just like he has always been, he is also a God of mercy, just as he always has been. And so he says that he won't come and completely wipe them out. But he calls them to repentance. He calls them, in verse 7, to return to me, and I will return to you. 
God has amazingly offered forgiveness to this arrogant bunch. And he's amazingly offered forgiveness to us today. But notice their response in chapter 3 and verse 7. They say, how shall we return? Now, on the surface, that looks like a great question. Uh, in fact, it really is a great question if we're sincere about it. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, that was response after Peter's sermon. They said, well, what, what shall we do? It's a wonderful question. But knowing these people and how they've been throughout this book, I don't think they're asking a sincere, penitent question about how they can return and be faithful to God. Instead, I believe that they don't even think they've left God. And so they ask, well, how can we return since we've never left you in the first place? Are we just unable to repent of our sins today and return to God because we refuse to open our eyes and see our sins? We don't know how to return because we don't think we've left. We don't see the filth of our own sins. And we'll talk more about the filth and high cost of sin uh, in tomorrow night's lesson. But the first thing we must do is, in returning to God is recognizing that we've left him. To acknowledge our sin. To be poor in spirit and to plead for forgiveness. But God answers their question of how to return by pointing out that they, one way that they could return to him is to stop robbing him. Well, that's quite a thing for people to be robbing God. That God says, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? What an incredible thought to think of someone trying to steal from an all-powerful, all-knowing, and always-present God. Who would, who would possibly do such a thing? But of course, they respond with their regular ignorant and arrogant questions by saying in verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8, How have we robbed you? They can't see any way in which they rob God. So God spells it out to them. They were supposed to bring him the whole tithe. Now a tithe was uh, a tenth of everything that they had, had made, had received. But it says that they didn't bring him the whole tithe. You know what that tells me is that they're bringing him some of the tithe. They're bringing him some of the things they were supposed to, but not all of what, God, what belonged to God. Do we do that? What, well, what belongs to God today? Everything belongs to God. So what does it look like for us to try to rob God today? Well, it looks like if we don't bring everything to God, if we hold any part of our life back from being fully devoted to God, then we are just like these arrogant Israelites who are robbing God. Maybe it's some aspect, This maybe you're only Sunday and Wednesday. That's the only times I give to God. Well, you're robbing God of five days of the week. Maybe it's some aspect of your life and your family or some sin that you just won't give up. Or maybe it's your time or your energy or your thoughts. Whatever you're holding back from God, if you're holding it back from God, then you're robbing God because it belongs to him. But if they, or if we today, would just simply stop robbing God, then he says that he would open the windows of heaven and would bless us greatly. I love that imagery. Of him. He's just saying, I'm going to open the windows and just pour out these blessings on you. You see Jesus telling the apostles a similar thing in Mark chapter 10, verses 28 to 31, that he would bless those who had given up things for him. Ephesians chapter 1, if you just ever want to be encouraged, just read through Ephesians chapter 1 and count the blessings given to us in Christ. God wants to bless us if we'll just return to him. And similar statements were made in the book of Haggai, as we saw on Sunday, um, that while they were procrastinating to build God's temple, he said, you need to consider your ways. And then in chapter 2, when they had finally considered their ways and started rebuilding, God tells them to mark this day on the calendar. He says, in the past, things have been going poorly for you, but now that you've started building the temple, things are going to change, and you're going to be blessed. God wants to bless us if we just stop robbing him. And finally, God tells them what I've been saying this whole lesson, that their words had just been arrogant against God. In chapter 3, and verse 13, and too often, uh, so have our words and our thoughts been arrogant against God. But of course, they respond with yet another arrogant question. A few more arrogant words against God. In verse 13, they say, well, what have we spoken against you? God says, you've spoken these arrogant words against me. And they say, what? What have we said? They still to refuse to acknowledge their sins and their rebellion against the word of God. So God tells them what they have arrogantly said against him. They've said in verses 14 to 15, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it if we have kept his charge and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the arrogant blessed 
Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. There they basically said to God, what profit is it if we have kept God's charge? First off, they're assuming they've kept God's charge, and I think that's pretty clear at this point in the book. They have not done that, and so they're saying, why aren't we blessed for being good? And God says, first off, you're not being good. But secondly, that's an accusation against God that if you are doing evil, you're going to get away with it. They claim that there's no reward for the righteous and there's no punishment for the wicked. Do we feel that way sometimes? Do we think that way sometimes? That living righteously for God, whether we're actually doing that or not, that living righteously for God is just not worth it? That those who are evil are going to be able to escape the judgment of God? Well, God is, responds pretty forcefully to that idea here in Malachi. He spells out that he is paying attention. He is listening. In fact, he's writing it down in a book of remembrance. What we do or what we don't do will not be forgotten by God. And will be rewarded accordingly, for better or for worse. The righteous will belong to God as the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. But the wicked will be set ablaze. Then the difference between the righteous and the wicked, which they couldn't tell, that will be very clear, will be very obvious. But what if someone had been unrighteous? What if someone had been living unrighteously? But then they wanted to return to God. Well, God says that he is going to send Elijah, we later find out to be John the Baptist, before that great and terrible day of the Lord, and he will restore their hearts, so that God will not come to smite the land with a curse, but rather to bring a blessing. And thank the Lord for sending John the Baptist and then coming himself in the form of Jesus, uh, the Father sending his only begotten Son who died for us because, just as this book of Malachi began, God says, I've loved you. He gave his Son, his only begotten Son, because he loved us. So hopefully we look at this book of Malachi and we see the way that the people lived there and we see the arrogant and just ignorant questions that they asked God. And when we come before God, let's not ask the same questions, because too often I think we're in the same boat. I think we act the same way. We're doing righteous things. We're, we're doing things for the Lord, but our heart's not in it. Or we don't care to make sure to do it the right way. Or we're not honoring God and putting him first. So let's learn from this, in this case, bad example of the Israelites. And obey God and turn back to him. Return to God, and he will return to us. If there's any way that we can help you in your returning to God tonight, and obeying God and honoring him, and as we sung, becoming more like him. Let us know how we can help you as we stand and we sing the song of invitation.